Welcome back, everybody. Today we have the great pleasure to have with us uh, Jeff Halper, uh, uh, Israeli American anthropologist, uh, political activist, uh, author of uh, several books on the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Uh, he has lived in uh, Israel since uh, 1973. Uh, he's also the director of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions uh, and co-founder of the One Democratic Stake campaign. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for uh, being with us, Jeff, and for accepting our invitation. Thanks for having me. So, Jeff, um, in your <clears throat> book, uh, War Against the People, uh, Israel, the Palestinians and the Global Pacification, you say that occupation has never represented a financial burden for Israel, but exactly the opposite, since, Palest since Palestine is kind of a testing ground for new military equipment of Israel and other armed forces around the world. Uh, but at the same time, don't you think that uh, now a uh, prolonged war in Gaza uh, also raises uh, uh, prob problems for uh, economic resilience of, his, of Israel? Well, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of a short-term, long-term proposition. In other words, uh, uh, you know, as I ask in my book, uh, War Against the People, how does Israel get away with this? You know... <clears throat> My answer is, or at least one of my answers, is that um, <clears throat> because of the, of the certain weaponry that it develops in terms of wars against the people, that's the new kind of warfare today. When, neo, when neoliberal capitalism is beginning to contract and less and less people, including in the global north, have access to the market and income disparities grow tremendously, and there's more and more protests and resistance to this. <clears throat> you know, the Pentagon's F-35s and nuclear weapons don't help. You need wars, you know, weapons, surveillance devices, technologies of repression to be used against the people themselves because they're the ones that are resisting. And that's where the Palestinian laboratory is so useful for Israel because you've got 5 million Palestinians that you can do anything you want to with. There's 600 and some checkpoints. You can test all your biometric surveillance devices. Uh, you know, everything. There's thousands of, uh, of uh, cutting edge uh, surveillance cameras all over uh, Palestine, all over the occupied territories. All the weaponry that Israel is using now in Gaza from drones to AI. There are now new AI technologies that are actually identifying more targets in, in Gaza than, than the Israeli army can attack. And, and the list goes on and on. <clears throat> so that it's true in the short term, like these last few months in Gaza, it has cost Israel. Um, you know, Israel has <clears throat> obviously had to use its weapons stockpiles. A lot of it's... Uh, you know, because of, of, of the army and, uh, you know, uh, the because uh, it doesn't have a large standing army. A lot of the people that would normally be out doing business are in the army. That's really hurt the, the local economies. And there's also been some pushback in terms of investment in Israel's high tech. You know, BDS and, you know, if not BDS itself, a certain uh, uh, hesitation, especially as, you know, um, so Moody's and Standards and Poor and, and uh, you know, some of these international credit, uh, credit agencies are lowering Israel's credit standing. So there is a, a problem here. But I think in the long term, what Israel understands is that it has really built a niche in the global system that, I mean, it's not the only country to do this, but that Israel really has this niche of the war against the people. So both from the point of view of its usefulness to the global north, to the G7 especially, that are trying to keep their hegemony, um, especially vis-a-vis -vis Chinese and BRICS challenges, um, in terms of governments that are themselves repressing their own populations. You look at, the, at Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is not normalizing with Israel or the Gulf states, because they love Zionism all of a sudden, but because Israel gives them these technologies of repression 
including, for example, Pegasus, this, uh, you know, spyware in your telephone uh, that is very useful for them. And just one more thing, you know, Israel isn't only though a client state of the, of, of, of the G7. Israel is, is, I think, the second largest arms exporter to China. Israel is the second largest arms exporter to India after Russia. You know, all the BRICS countries that are supposed to be the alternative to the G7 uh, are all being supplied and have very close relations with Israel. So it's true that in the short term, there's bumps. And Israel is having, you know, short-term economic issues. But in the long term, I think Israel really sees the advantages of what it's doing in Gaza. There's, there'll never be sanctions in Israel. So Israel doesn't have to worry about sanctions. What it has to worry about is, you know, the, the outrage over what's happening in Gaza. It believes that will calm down over time. You know, there's no risk that the G7 is going to to pull its uh, support for Israel in any way. And, uh, and again, you know, the, both the global north and the Arab states need this normalization with Israel uh, for all kinds of reasons. And so I think Israel says in the long term we'll be fine. And on the contrary, this is actually helping us in the long term because it strengthens, uh, it, it, it adds to the arsenal of these these uh, technologies of repression that we can offer governments all over the world. Clear. That's the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, could you could you help us better understand uh, um, what interpretation of uh, the last events could we say uh, an Israeli Jew like you give? Uh, um, I mean, uh, you said that, uh, uh, for instance, the 7th of October was a symptom of uh, continual colonization, uh, a state of apartheid uh, and continuous suffering of the Palestinian people. But, uh, um, I mean, why is it so difficult to Israeli people to understand that? Well, it's not that it's difficult for them, it's just that they, um... <clears throat> you know, um... <clears throat> it's kind of hard to explain, not, not really hard to explain, but, you know, um, Zionism and Israel are settler colonial movements. In other words, the, it, it, as, as a settler colonial enterprise, Zionism intention was to take over Palestine, displace the Palestinians and replace them with, you know, transform an Arab country into a Jewish country. And this is a very violent process. You know, in the Nakba in 1948, 85% of the Palestinians that lived within what became Israel were driven out. You know, you have house demolitions, you have killings, you have uh, military repression, occupation, apartheid, you know, you, you know uh, land expropriation, uh, and, 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 and all of that. <clears throat> well, if you want your population to support that, um, what you have to do is insulate them into kind of a bubble, you know? So there's two forms of bubbles. One is the Zionist narrative, which is very clear and very closed. And that is that this is the land of Israel. God gave us this land, or at least this is where the Jewish people developed as a nation. This was our country. We were driven out by the Romans, which, by the way, is not true historically, but that's a key part of the narrative, because every settler colonial movement makes up a narrative that justifies why they're taking over whatever country they want, whether it's North America or South Africa or Australia or, or anywhere else. Uh, and, 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 of course, the Bible is the ready-made narrative for, for Zionism. And so we're coming back to our country, and we have an exclusive claim. This is our country and the Arabs, because we don't use the word Palestinians, because to say Palestinian would, would legitimize and recognize another national group that we deny have any claim to the country. And so, uh, and so our job is to, look, we don't have to displace the Arabs. We have to take their land. Of course, you can't you can't set up a Jewish state in a populated country without taking the land. 
we have to displace them. But to the degree that, uh, you know, that they go along with that, they don't resist, they can stay here. In other words, it's a, it's a self-contained narrative. It's not anti-Arab. It, it's just that, you know, so if the Arabs shut up and know their place and don't make problems, they can stay wherever they are in the nooks and crannies of our country. But the minute they resist, you see, like in all colonial enterprises, resistance is framed as criminal. It's not political, right? Because Part of the trick of settler colonialism is not only to establish the, the settler state in place of the peoples that were here, but to normalize it. So Israel becomes a normal place. If you go in your city to the travel agency and say, I want to buy a ticket to Israel, fine. <laughs> you say, I want to buy a ticket to Palestine. And nobody knows what the hell you're talking about, besides which there's no airport in Palestine. And no, you see, and that's part of the normalization process. So, so the narrative then normalizes things for Israelis, that this is our country and we're a peaceful people and we're being attacked by criminals, basically. It's, a, it's, it's been depoliticized. We're being attacked by criminals. And so the entire Palestinian issue of Palestinian national rights, what's happened to the Palestinians, their history, their identity, their rights, is all reduced to security and terrorism. That's all it is. And is, and so Israelis are really off the hook. We're simply normal people, like you are, uh, fighting against terrorism. And that, that's the way it is. And then the second part of the insulation is, is, is almost physical that Israelis never, ever encounter the occupation. They don't go to the West Bank. Even settlers that go to the West Bank go on Israeli roads. They don't go through Palestinian villages or towns. They don't see Arabs. They don't encounter Arabs. They're in this, this zone of comfort all the time. And so Israelis never encounter the wall checkpoints and certainly never encounter house demolitions or they never they never you know uh even get close to experiencing or witnessing anything happening to palestinians if you put those two things together we're living a normal life as a matter of fact today <laughs> this is really this is a whole program she devoted to this the the world's happiness index was was published Israel is the fourth happiest country in the world. The United States came in 23. Where or 22, I think. Where Germany is 23. Where Italy is, I don't know, but but the, Israel, you know, with everything going on here is number 4 in the uh, so that shows you the ability of the government and the media to really insulate the population in a way that that life is good for them as law and 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 they rely on the army that's the trauma of october 7th you see they relied on the army to keep this whole thing intact the bubble intact all of a sudden poof somebody broke through the bubble and and that is what was really traumatizing to israelis now what happens if we're not safe what happens if we're not insulated? What happens if these terrorists are able to somehow, you know, the idea was it was always contained and not only contained, but again, to go back to war against the people, your first question, it was even curried. In other words, Israel intentionally, in my view, keeps this war of low intensity conflict going all the time. It even lets it get bigger in periodic assaults on Gaza in order to test its weapon systems and surveillance systems. I mean, you can't, you can't have a laboratory without, without. So in other words, Israel has an interest in, in this contained violence, this contained uh, warfare. All of a sudden it got out of control, you see, and the Israeli army is really in a, in a dilemma now. It was traumatic for the army as well. Now it has to restore the confidence of the people that we can keep this whole enterprise going, you know? And uh, so that's the trauma. 
it's not the trauma of uh, you know the, the genocide happening to the Palestinians isn't even part of the part of the the equation. So that you know that explains to some degree why Israelis are the fourth happiest people in the world. But uh, I mean. Uh... Uh, there are not newspapers or media that give other interpretations more close to to yours and uh, could be able to open a little door in this uh, bubble that you have uh, described because uh, here uh, in the west we always talk about uh, Israel also as a great uh, democracy but right, uh, right. beside this beside this topic uh, um we 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 think that there are um kind of dialectic also in the public um, opinion no uh, but um, now there is not uh. well but that's really interesting and this is something that really we all have to think about israel is an open society you know you do have alternative critical sources of information or it's a newspaper my son i'm proud to say is the editor of the English language website of Haaretz, which is very critical. You don't get much critical articles like that in the press abroad. You've got, you know, and the television, even the state television can be fairly critical. You know, it isn't that the, that the information is not there. Then you have NGOs, you have 972, you know, this alternative news, uh, uh, you know, from young Israelis. You have Israeli activists uh, involved. Then you have NGOs involved here. You've got other political groups going all the way up to, you know, uh, the Internet and the, the, the millions of articles and so on. And Israelis are educated. They have TVs. They have all the Internet channels. Half the Israeli public goes abroad every year. So it, it's really an interesting case study on how an open society, with access to alternative critical information can can become this kind of a groupthink country. 94% of Israelis support what's going on in Gaza. That means the liberals, you know, the liberal Zionists, my, all my liberal friends, you know, uh, now you've got a whole phenomenon of people on the left that are saying, well, we've been disillusioned by what happened in October 7th, and they really are terrorists. And that, you know, in other words, it, it, it's a really good example that really deserves uh, thought and research, even discussion of how uh, it's probably the best example of how an open society can really be controlled. And, uh, you know, and you can you can create a group think among people, even even with the existence of alternative information and people going out and so on. So if that can happen here, it could certainly happen in your country or other countries. And I think that's another issue maybe, but I think it's, Israel is sort of the extreme example of an open society that, that in, in which everybody, because of the narrative, because of the insulation, uh, and because they can't deal with what they've done, you know, that's also part of the equation. You know, settler colonialism is a very violent thing, so that it's important that everything starts on October 7th. They attacked us. We're the victims. We're simply, uh, you know, retaliating or reacting. Because if you go back before October 7th, uh, you know, you open a whole Pandora's box of our responsibility. And so you close that down as well. There's all kinds of mechanisms that are worth really writing about in terms of uh, how you turn an open society into a closed society without a point. Right, right. And uh, talking about the, um, the West Bank, uh, because the, um, we, we could say that the 7 October gave a kind of a free hand to some extremist Jews to eradicate the uh, entire Arab communities from the West Bank. And um, it's something that there is uh, a little uh, attention on also from the international community. Right. So could you could you tell us a bit uh, more about what's going on uh, there? Well, you know, all our attention is appropriately on Gaza. I mean, there really is a genocide going on and that deserves our attention. But politically speaking, the West Bank is much more important than Gaza. Gaza is marginal for Israel. Uh, and, um, and in fact, they're trying very hard to pass it on to 
somebody else. If it's not Egypt, then maybe an Arab coalition or maybe the UN or, you know, Israel just wants to get rid of it. So Israel's expanding eastward into the West Bank or what we call Judea and Samaria that Zionism and Judaism is, have always considered the heart of the land of Israel. Uh, <clears throat> and that's where the settlements are. There are today 750,000 settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Um, and <clears throat> so, so, uh, so part of the, you know, Israel is right at the cusp of the, of normalization. I mean, it's fairly much normalized. We don't even talk about occupation in Israel. You know, we, we talk about um, Judea, you know, the Jewish residents of the communities of Judea and Samaria. It's mm -hmm. all been sanitized, you see. Uh, what's missing is uh, the international legitimization for it all. And that's the normalization process. You see, that's where... The United States and Europe working with the Western oriented Arab countries, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states and so on, Jordan, Egypt, um, are trying to normalize. And and actually, this kind of explains partly the timing of the October 7th attack. Netanyahu, if we remember, a week or two before was in the U.N. showing a map of Israel which is all of Israel from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River. There is no occupied territory saying that we're right at the, at the, at the moment of signing a normalization agreement with Saudi Arabia. If that had happened, the Palestinians would have been erased, eliminated as any kind of political actor. And that's when October 7th happened. So as much as we can criticize terrorism, terrorism is uh, a part you might even say a legitimate part. You know, Zionists use terrorism extremely uh, uh, effectively, you know, in the pre-state uh, time against the British uh, and against the Palestinians as well. So, and sometimes against each other. Um, and terrorism has been used in, in conflicts all over the world so that, so that you could say that in many ways the, uh, the, uh, the action of Hamas on October 7th really was a significant political act that had to be done in order to, to end the normalization process because not only does the normalization process eliminate the Palestinians, but at the same time, it legitimizes. And this is Israel's big interest. It legitimizes the apartheid regime that Israel has set out over the entire, in other words, the entire historic Palestine from the river to the sea, becomes Israel. You know, with uh, these Palestinian banks. So you take these little islands where the Palestinians are confined, Bantu stands in a South African sense, and you call them a state. So Biden says, that, well, now we have a two-state solution. But in fact, it's apartheid. And this is what would have been legitimized had this whole process gone through. So I think it's really important um, that we... Uh, that we understand, uh, you know, this process of normalization, and 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 so what's happening. So ju just one sentence more. So then, what's happening in the West Bank is sort of the last mopping up operations before the normalization of everything. In other words, the most vital settlers have been militarized. They've been drafted into the Israeli army. They're in a unit that's called Desert Frontier. They're given guns, they're given authority, and they're unleashed onto the Palestinians. 16 Palestinian communities have been abandoned so far. So <clears throat> the, the land is being taken, Palestinians are being driven out, and that's sort of the last little mopping up that has to be done in order to just clear the way for normalization uh, in which then Israel will have in other words, the two-state solution that Biden is envisioning will be Israel on 78% of the country, plus East Jerusalem and its major settlements in the western part of the West Bank. So now Israel expands to 85% of the country, and Palestinians locked into little islands into a Bantustan that then Biden and everybody will call a state, the Palestinian state. 
And that's where it's all going. And that's where the West Bank, uh, actually what's happening in the West Bank today is more significant politically than what's happening in Gaza. And don't, you don't think, right, that uh, the two-state solution is the best solution? Because uh, here, um, here in the West, all the pro-Palestinian uh, movements uh, think that uh, the two-state solution is the, is the best we can achieve right now. But you have always said that uh, maybe the one-state solution uh, uh, would be better, right? Not only that, we have to stop talking about the two-state solution. The two-state solution is apartheid. I mean, you're not going to remove 750,000 Israelis from the occupied territory. So the more you talk about two states and try to work around the settlements, well, we'll give the Palestinians a little bit of land in the Negev. You know, a big part of the idea is we'll give the Gaza, we'll make Gaza a little bit bigger. We'll give them some of the desert by Egypt. Make Gaza a little bit, you know. The point is to get to the 22%. That Israel is 78% of the country, Palestinians are 22%, because that's what the occupied territories are. But the issue isn't territory. The issue is sovereignty and economic viability. You know, do Palestinians have genuine sovereignty? No, under the two state, because Israel keeps control of the borders. Israel keeps militarily. Israel keeps control of the airspace. Israel keeps control of the electromagnetic sphere, which is the communication sphere. Israel keeps East Jerusalem, which is already annexed. It's not even negotiable. East Jerusalem is the economic heart of a Palestinian state because it's the, the main tourist site. And tourism is one of the major industries in Palestine. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, there will be no seaport in Gaza. Israel will not allow a seaport in Gaza. Uh, it won't allow an, an airport, even in the West Bank, a major airport. Uh, and uh, so there is no sovereignty. And Israel controls, by the way, in, in, in any agreement Israel would agree to, that, Bush, that Biden is pushing, that Israel controls internally the security in Palestine. So that the occupation continues under the guise of, and then economic viability. Again, if you don't have East Jerusalem, if you don't have... Uh, open borders for trading with the Arab world or with Israel. Uh, all of that stuff, the, the ability to develop, you don't have access to your resources. Israel controls all the water. You know, Israel controls the most fertile land. So you can have a Palestinian state, but again, it's a non-viable, non-sovereign Bantustan, truncated into three or four or five little islands. Well, is that what the left really wants? And the big problem with the two-state, conceptually, is that it's, it confuses a conflict with a colonial situation. We are not in a conflict between two peoples. We're in a colonial situation where Zionism was an, a Jewish colonial movement to take over Palestine, <clears throat> and the Palestinians are the indigenous population that's resisting their displacement and, and erasure as a people. You can't make those equivalent. The two-state idea as a conflict says, well, there's two sides. Well, the minute you talk about a side, you're legitimizing this, this Zionist colonization process. You're legitimizing colonization. And then you're saying, well, how do you get out of a conflict? You negotiate. You compromise. Well, what do we expect the Palestinians to compromise on? That they lose 78, 80, 85% of their country? That, uh, that they recognize this colonial entity that drove half their people out of the country, that the refugees will stay refugees forever because there's nowhere for them to come back to, that, that they have no patrimony anymore, they have no heritage, they have no... What are we exactly expecting in this two-state idea the Palestinians to compromise on? So, you know, I, I'm shocked that the left still supports this. I understand why governments do. Governments do because it's a great conflict management tool. In other words, now Biden can say, yes, I support Palestinian rights. Palestinians should have a state. You know, we want peace. We want negotiate all the right stuff. Right. And they can keep saying that for the next hundred years because it'll never it'll never happen. You see, so you, you conflict management just keeps the thing going, going, going. And now, if we are at a point where they want to normalize everything, 
then again, the two-state solution can't be a real two-state solution because Israel would never allow, what, you're going to give Judea, Samaria, and Jerusalem to Arabs? That's incomprehensible for Israelis. So the only two-state solution has to be apartheid. And that the left supports this idea, for me, is very is sad, but it means that, the, that, that we don't understand really what the nature of this conflict is all about. It's not a conflict. The nature of this struggle is all about. But, and in which way the one state solution uh, would be more uh, reasonable? I mean, what kind of state right. do you think of? Well, first of all, there already is one state. It isn't, it isn't something, you know, it, there already is one state. Israel controls, there's one governing regime over the entire country today. You know, Israel's control goes from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River. Uh, it has its uh, legal system is, is over the entire country with the civil administration of the West Bank. Its government is over the entire country. There is already one state, but it's an apartheid state. So the one state idea is actually fairly simple and straightforward. Let's transform this one apartheid state that Israel created. And that's an important point. The Palestinians agreed to the two state idea. I think they made a, a fatal mistake, but they agree, and they still agree to it. Tomorrow, Abu Mazen would sign on a two-state deal if, if it was really offered. So they're not the problem. Israel's the one that created unilaterally one state apartheid. And that, I hope, is, is unacceptable to everyone, a, part, a new apartheid regime. And so <clears throat> the one democratic state idea simply says, let's transform you know, like in South Africa in many ways, let's transform an apartheid regime into a government that represents all its people. Let's give everyone in the country equal rights, one government, one parliament, one citizenship, one legal system. We're all in the same country with the right of return, of course. Refugees have the right then to return. And, uh, and I, you know, I don't know why that's such an outrageous idea to turn an apartheid regime into a democratic state. I mean, why is there such opposite? I know why, because it's not Jewish. But you can't have a Jewish state. Uh, you can't have an ethnically pure state anywhere. In Hungary, <laughs> where they're trying, in Poland. You know, you can't have those ethno-nationalists nation states that are pure in the 21st century because the, because there's diversity all over, including here. And so the only uh, solution that's just and workable is, is, uh, is one democratic state in which, however, and we, re we recognize that there are two national groups in this country, even though each group denies the other's national legitimacy, <clears throat> you know, there's Palestinian Arabs and there's Israeli Jews that despite the colonization of Zionism, have become over the last 75 years of sovereignty and national group. And I think Palestinians have to accept that. So that within the framework of a civil state, where we're all citizens, you do give space to the different national groups. Each national group can keep its language. Nobody's going to close the Hebrew University in Hebrew. Nobody's going to close Birzet University in Arabic. You keep your newspapers, your literature, there's Arabic TV stations and Hebrew speaking TV stations, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, in other words, there's there's museums of the different uh, whatever, you know, all the expression is there. Their religions are intact. Their religious places are all there's no threat. Everybody lives on two levels. They, we're living as we have a common civic identity in that we're all citizens of our state our state together. But on the other hand, we're also then members of national groups, ethnic groups, religious groups. You know, we have other identities as well. Uh, and so it's a, it's a good, I think, um, balance between um, uh, a civic identity that we all share and a new society, especially of young people emerging, um, you know, that's, that belongs to the state and nevertheless, give, acknowledging and giving a place to the different ethnic groups. But, but the, the trick is, and here where it's, it's hard, and this is where it's failed in other post-colonial states, 
can the civic the civil state that we all belong to be strong enough to resist the 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 opposition of the national groups because national the nature of nationalism is you want to have you want hegemony you want control you want to rule so the palestinian national group is going to want to push that this become palestine the israeli group's going to push that this becomes again somehow israel so we have to have a strong enough civil state with support for that and the idea that we're all citizens strong enough to contain those national groups and really make them cultural groups rather than 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 uh, competing political groups so it's it's complicated it's it's not going to be easy but this is the this is the only way out there is no other way you know you have the two peoples living here we're all living here and and uh, it's either apartheid i mean it's a very stark uh, you know it's either apartheid or um, or democracy. <laughs> so I don't know where the left is going to go with that, but hopefully it'll go with democracy. Uh, Jeff, I, I was wondering uh, a little bit to the broader picture, meaning from broader picture, uh, the international implication of all of this. No, first of all, I mean, how impossible, inimaginable is a one-state solution, as you were talking about, from the point of view of uh, U.S. imperialism, first of all. And second of all, uh, going to the position of the U.S. that now is uh, no, uh, trying to depict uh, Netanyahu as the super villain of the situation. So get, just get rid of Netanyahu and we, have, we will have uh, I mean, a fair Thanks. solution and a fair management of the, of the struggle and of the conflicts. And um, I mean, w what do you think about this? I mean, th there's... Uh, uh, how do you say, a reformist way out of this uh, escalation from Netanyahu, or uh, it's just taking some time and uh, in Gaza you will need a final solution anyway. I mean, it's yeah. not depending on Netanyahu. Look, governments are not our friends. Governments are on the side of Israel. Israel delivers for governments in a way the Palestinians could never do. What do the Palestinians have to offer? We live in a transactional world. So we, the people, you know, the three of us, we talk about justice, equality, peace, human rights, international law, anti-colonial struggles. That's not the language of governments. Gov that's ridiculous for governments, that kind of stuff. Um, and so, uh, you know, we can see it with the ICJ uh, decision on genocide. You know, it's a, it, it's, there's a wonderful laws of genocide, the genocide conventions. Uh, there's whole processes of sanctions, but it never gets the sanctions because there is no enforcement regime that's effective that, you know, that can be used if, if powerful governments oppose it, you know, so <clears throat> that's so so that there's a disconnect between us, the people, and, and the governments. Governments all run transactionally. You know, it's all deals and uh, interests and, and all of that. And, and in that, Israel has a much stronger position than the Palestinians do. They have no position whatsoever. So I think what we have to do, but, but the Palestinians do have a crucial ally, and that is us, the peoples of the world. Not governments, but the peoples have poured out all over the world in support of, of, of the Palestinians uh, with Gaza, but, but not only with Gaza, with the wider Palestinian struggle. I think the Palestinians, I don't think the one state idea is just some idealistic dream of a far, you know, I think it's actually doable. What's missing here, and I cut the Palestinians all the slack in the world, that this isn't criticism. Because they're in a very, they've been put in a very difficult situation of dispersal and <clears throat> fragmentation and so on. But what's lacking is a Palestinian political program, an end game that has to be articulated by Palestinians. We can't represent the Palestinians. We can support their struggle, but they have to be the ones that say, this is where we're going. They have to give us our marching orders. 
And in the anti-apartheid struggle, the ANC faced some of the same dilemmas. Their government was obviously against them, the apartheid government. The whites in South Africa that were dominant were not going to dismantle the apartheid regime. Governments were not going to support the ANC. And so they went to all of us. Everybody my age was a part of the anti-apartheid movement. You know, churches and trade unions and universities and activists, and they mobilized everybody. And so did the FLN in Algeria, by the way, in a very effective way. So that, so that, uh, the, but, but the difference was, and the peoples of the world are mobilizable. I think today, the, the, the support for Palestine as that is at the level of the anti-apartheid struggle. It's there, and people are primed even for the one state. What's lacking is the Palestinian voice, the Palestinian program, that leadership. The ANC always had an end game, and that was one person, one vote. So everybody knew why they were BDSing, why they were boycotting. You know, Mandela knew that he wasn't going to get out of jail, no matter what the clerk offered him, until there's one person, one vote. We don't have that with the Palestinian issue. You know, Abu Mazen talks about two states. You know, we're talking about, you know, our group, the one Democratic state group, which is Palestinian-led, talks about one state. Others talk about confederations or federations or no solution or it's impossible. There is no coherent message or program coming from the Palestinians that have to lead the struggle. It's their struggle. And, and that's, I think, and that's where our group is trying to insert that Palestinian voice. And, you know, we have a 10-point program that isn't the program, but it's the beginning of a discussion. And we're trying to get an intra-Palestinian discussion because if, I believe, if a critical mass of Palestinians comes together behind this one-state idea, and then they go to the international community all of us, the grassroots and all over the world, and say, this is where we're going. This is our demand. This is where we want you to go to your parliaments and your governments. One democratic state. I think we could replicate what the ANC did. And I think we can cause the collapse of the Israeli apartheid regime. But that can't happen, no matter what support the Palestinians have, unless they are taking... Now, Jeff, what I was wondering now, compared to the South African experience, is if, I mean, the, the role of Israel in the imperial structure of, of right. the U.S. imperialism is not much more important than what the, the South right. Africa was. So, from this point of view, how can we win from this point of view? Well, because I think, that, you know, look, Israel is important in that sense. But, you know, it's not the only actor. I mean, there are other, other countries that can do wars against, that have weaponry. Israel's not indispensable. It's useful, but not indispensable. And if we can create a situation in which Israel becomes counterproductive, Biden might lose the election because of, of, of his policies in Gaza. You know, uh, uh, if we can make Israel uh, 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 a, um, a burden on, on governments so that, it, so that supporting Israel in terms of public opinion, in terms of getting elected, in terms of corporations, for example, the turning point in South Africa was when the Ford Motor Company pulled out and corporations said, we don't want to be soiled by association with the apartheid regime. That's happening here as well. I said at the very beginning, you know, there are a lot of the credit agencies are lowering Israel's credit standings. A lot of investors are not investing in, in Israeli high tech. Israeli high tech is very important. It's very sophisticated. And, and especially in the military wings. But even so, investors are saying, wait a minute. No, maybe we shouldn't do this. You know, not for moral reasons, but, you know, uh, they don't want to be soiled. And and and. And this might not be a good investment. And, you know, and, and, and maybe we can't keep this whole ship afloat forever. And, and, and all these things, there's all kinds of cracks that we can exploit. So it's true that on one level, Israel gets away with it because of this. But I think we're beginning to see now that it's not necessarily getting away with it. And if we, what I'm trying to say is if we insert a strong 
focused Palestinian voice with an end game, a political program that mobilizes everybody, I think that would be, you know, what pushes us over the hump. That would be the thing that would galvanize everyone. And I think then we could exploit Israel's weaknesses and these criticisms and cause its collapse. I really do believe that. Ale. Right. Um, no, I had, I had just last uh, brief question. It's a bit uh, technical. It's a bit uh, difficult, maybe. But um, uh, would you define what's going on in uh, Gaza a uh, genocide or not? Of course it's genocide. <laughs> We, uh, in my organization, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, uh, maybe two or three weeks after October 7th, we issued a statement already saying this is genocide. And of course, the ICJ also, it hasn't ruled that it's genocide, but it has said what Israel is doing falls within the parameters of the genocide convention and it's plausible genocide. So, you know, uh, you know, so, you know, this has, uh, you know, international legal backing this charge of genocide. But the point I want to make, though, is that Gaza does not stand by itself. It's not an argument, is, is Gaza genocide or is it just a war crime <laughs> or just a crime against humanity? Mm -hmm. That's not the issue, because if you put Gaza within the framework of what's been happening since the Nakba, since 1947-48, the destruction systematically of the Palestinian people and the taking of their lands and, and so on, um, even before 47, going back to... Uh, 36 and the Zionist participation with the British in repressing the Arab revolt. And even before that, in other words, there's a, a process of genocide that's been going on now for a century. Uh, genocide is built into the settler colonial enterprise because you can't, ha you can't transform an Arab country into a Jewish country without genocide. Uh, and so and so I think that's the framework we should look at. Not that Gaza stands by itself. Gaza is maybe the most visible and horrific example of genocide, but it fits within certainly uh, a 75 year, if not century long process of um, of uh, a systematic campaign of, of Zion, you know, of Zionist colonialism of genocide against the Palestinian people. And I think that's how we have to look at it. And it's ongoing. And that's where, again, we have to connect the West Bank and the bigger picture into it and not leave Gaza as kind of a standalone sort of an entity. Yeah, clear. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, you have a last question? Uh, no, 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 it's okay, okay for me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, Jeff, for thanks this, for uh, having me. Conversation, and uh, right. of course, we hope that uh, we'll have other opportunities if you keep uh, accepting our invitations. I'm here, no problem. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much, much, Jeff. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you both. Bye, bye. bye. everybody. See you in the next episode. Bye bye. bye. bye.